Welcome back to Sociology of Global Social Problems. My name is Dr. Beverly Yin Thompson and I will be your instructor. We're using this textbook for our class, Global Problems, the Search for Equity, Peace, and Sustainability. In this video, we're gonna be talking about chapter three called Gender and Family, Overburdened Women and Displaced Men. The learning objectives for this chapter are for us to take a global perspective and understand how gender norms and behaviors are produced in different regions of the globe, how those gender norms were constructed historically and culturally, and how they're changing over time. And of course, we wanna understand the uneven development, not only between nations, but within a nation. And so as we've seen in previous chapters, there's a great divide between the urban metropolitan areas of a country and the rural areas still have a higher percentage of poverty. And we see a lot of the modernization elements within the urban realm. And so we can imagine that the, that the life between men and women is very different within the urban sectors and within the the rural parts of the country. We want to understand the shifting roles of gender norms and expectations and especially examining within the family how that intersects with the workplace and how the changing financial needs of people are impacting the work that they need to pursue, how that intersects with their home and family life, as well as out migration, migration based on seeking labor, how that might take men away from rural areas and leave women and children behind and increase the poverty levels among women and children. We also want to understand that the improvements for women's conditions have often been based on social movements. And so for my students, we should especially think of our own example of a social movement in a particular country and the gender equity outcomes that were the object for the social movement. And as always, we want to really examine the key words of the chapter and make sure that we can define them and understand them on our own. So each of these chapters opens with an illustrative vignette of a particular country and its relationship to the topic of the chapter. And so this chapter opens with a vignette from India. And first of all, it establishes the large context of how the diversity within the subcontinent of India and how each region of India does have different specializations and focuses, has different kinds of historical trajectories, development trajectories, and focus on particular industries. So India, of course, is the country with the largest population of any nation, and it has a huge geographic and cultural diversity. This vignette sketches out some of the details of the country. For example, the author states southern india the author states is racing towards a high-tech future india has more software engineers than anywhere else in the world mumbai and chennai turn out more movies than hollywood here they speak of bollywood chennai flourishes with back office operations the data processing for u.s japanese and european firms can be done at a fraction of the cost here now even U.S. newspapers are looking at having their editing and layout work done here. Radiology clinics and U.S. hospitals can send digital files here in the middle of the night to be read and returned by the next day. And they talk about the socially progressive state of Kerala and how there's a lot of social movements and strong unions within that state. But because of that, a lot of companies won't come to that state. And so those companies go to other states where they can you know, exploit workers more. And so Kerala as a state actually depends on remittances of their residents going to other states or other countries to earn money and then sending that money back. The author states that birth rates remain high in the northern cow belt but are falling in the south. So even issues such as the birth rate are of course different in different parts of a country. And so overall this vignette is showing that India is a very diverse country with a lot of different outcomes for women and men. So the author asks us to question the future of India and where it will go within this global context. And so which industry 
industries might arise, which relationships with other nations might fuel those rises, and how are men and women going to work together towards this future, and what are those gender norms going to look like? The opening content section of this chapter then is called Nietzsche Undone, From Superman to Supermom. This section is trying to establish us with some theoretical and philosophical points coming out of the European context and thinking about where gender norms might come from originally. So the author talks about, for example, the ideal man of Athens was free from male drudgery like plowing the rocky Greek soil to discuss matters of importance in the city market, to trade and converse, to worship on the hillside, and to vote in the assembly. Meanwhile, the ideal Athenian woman, at least in the male mind, was largely cloistered at home, leading to the narrow range of domestic duties to benefit her temperance. The author talks about the ideals of the 15th century Italian Renaissance man, citizens of ancient Greece, and just the establishment of these ideals of manhood. And of course, the author is using Nietzsche's concept of the Ubermensch, the Superman, and so this ideal character that has been established historically in ancient philosophy, and how therefore the ideal woman is a complement to this man, the man of the urban metropolis, the man who is working, who has his home, and the woman who is cloistered in the home, caretaking children, and if this family has money and resources, then servants and domestic help are used within this house. The author talks about Victorian educated women of the 1800s were well educated and wealthy in order to provide the proper companionship to their wealthy husbands. And just the ideals of this Victorian then womanhood and how that has seeped into British culture and how that was brought to the United States. The author fast forwards into the United States, World War I, World War II, and states that fully one fifth of US women were in the paid labor force. Many were immigrant women in the early 1900s and late 1800s. In the 1920s, US women sometimes worked as an expression of newfound independence. And so there was a bump of women within the world workforce in the 1920s, during World War II, and of course in the 60s. And this section also talks about how these ideals of manhood were embedded in the very institutions of professions. And so professions were specifically constructed assuming this ideal male worker who has a wife at home to support him in the domestic realm, who has children that are being cared for by the wife. If these occupations are based on this particular understanding of what the ideal worker is, how does that impact and how does that shift when women therefore come into these professions in large numbers? And so the author mentions the occupations of medicine and law, for example, education, higher education, and how those were specifically shaped, assuming this ideal male worker. And so this section is going from 1500s Italian Renaissance men, ancient Athenian and Greek ideal citizens into the Victorian era, into early colonial times in the United States, and all the way up to World War II and the 1960s and women entering into the occupations. The author is just trying to establish that early concepts of careers and professions established in Europe in these 1500s and onward were established on this ideals of masculinity. And now in our globalized era, women are entering into the workforce in huge numbers around the world. Things are changing rapidly, not only within the workplace, but of course within the families. And how does that affect work-based migration? So you might lose family members as they out-migrate to work and send home remittances to those who remain. The next section is called Masculinity as Vulnerability the harder they fall. So the first sentence says, around the world, male privilege is persistent but precarious. As they will talk about later in the chapter, patriarchy and male dominance have been the norm around the world overwhelmingly. And so 
the understanding of male privilege is understanding that the majority of cultures around the world and throughout known history have been male dominated and followed institutions that are based on patriarchal norms, which is providing men with the power in society and heritage and lineage through the male side of the family. So men keep the family name and men pass their family name on to the children. Women take on the man's family name and so on. However, things are changing. And so globally, men are still the dominant sex within the power structures globally. However, of course, there's a huge class divide. And so the men that control the power and retain the power in society through governments, through companies, through property ownership are the wealthier men of that society. And so the men that have really lost ground globally then are working class men, men who have used their physical labor in order to provide for a family are now really seeing their jobs outsourced. They're seeing technology take their jobs away. They're losing their power within lower socioeconomic status groups especially. The author points out, of course, that there's always been men who have been vulnerable, who have been the working poor, men who are not able to provide a stable income to support a family. But in our recent history, thinking about in the 40s and the 60s, working class men, and especially now the author is looking at the United States, looking at working class white men during these post-World War II times periods in which a man could work in a factory job and support a family with that wage. And so those are the types of jobs that have been lost and now those same workers might be facing competition of teenagers working in the service industry earning just the minimum wage instead of that previous family union wage. And so this section is just pointing out their severe class disadvantage trumps their gender privilege. So it's especially these working class and lower middle class men that are losing ground and losing power and status within their employment prospects and especially in contrast to women who've made huge gains over the last hundred years. And so we can't talk about one gender without talking about how everyone is affected by these shifts. And so a lot of attention has gone to the changes in women's rights, women's roles in the workplace, women's double burden with the families, but less attention has been paid to these impacts on how men's expectations and gender roles are changing and how their status in the family is changing and indeed especially for working class and lower middle class men they are losing ground and may even rely on a wife or partner to support the family or support the family fully. Similar to the last section, this section is called Tired, Stressed Women and Angry, Alienated Men. So we saw in the last section that men are losing ground, especially working class, lower middle class men who are able to perhaps not have a college education and still make a strong family wage in the 1950s, in the 1960s and 70s, have lost tremendous ground in that era as the very wealthy men in the ruling elite of these societies in government and business then offshore these jobs to other nations. And so in this section, the author is especially focusing on the concept of the feminization of poverty. So in other countries where these men might begin to out migrate to either the urban areas in within their country or to other countries then leave behind women and children perhaps in rural areas. And this is where we get the concept then of the feminization of poverty. These women, these children that are left back, especially if they're in rural areas, are then falling into deeper poverty because now they've lost their male wage earner who perhaps was securely employed previously but now is in the urban area searching for work and sending back infrequent remittances. So the author is saying that with all of women's advances in the workplace, women are able to now go to school in much larger numbers than previously. They're able to enter college, they're able to enter into these especially professional professions or just become employed in much greater numbers 
numbers, they still retain the responsibility within the house. They still need to provide the majority of child care, of domestic labor, of care for elderly parents and so on. So the author cites Hothschild's book from 2012 called The Second Shift, which really documents this kind of double burden that women have. And in this section, he talks about different countries. In Latin America, women use the term doble jornada, double day's journey or machismo to talk about this focus on male central position and masculinity. In Japan, a majority of women are in the paid workforce, but they face wage discrimination that is great, the greatest in the industrialized world. And even when men are unemployed and at home, they do not pick up and share the domestic chores within the household because they really associate that with women's work and perhaps they're already feeling vulnerable, they're unemployed, they've lost their job. And so now to add situation of alienation and displacement to take on then women's labor is an affront to their masculinity. And so it's especially true with unemployed men and men who are feeling that that kind of alienation to reject that taking on of women's work. So they're not therefore helping out with uh, an equalizing in these roles, so women still have this burden. And they're talking about what do men do when they are now laid off in these situations. And so other ways in which men might find employment are the rising demand in the security realm. So now with the increase in inequalities, you have a booming industry of security and security guards, which is still very highly associated with masculinity. And even turn to criminal activity, odd jobs, working under the table and what have you. And they're saying that even in countries like Mexico, that have these assembly plants within their borders, Mexico, the Caribbean, East Asia. These assembly plants want to hire a compliant female workforce and do not hire men because men are gonna complain about the conditions of labor. More low pay, repetitive work, whereas women, the companies assume, are mo much more compliant as workers. However, this section also talks about how in especially contemporary societies, especially for middle class and up upper middle class men in Europe, in the United States and Western countries, that the author Hothschild in 2001 called the time bind. In these developed countries for middle class and upper middle class men, they actually want to spend a lot more time with their children and be a lot more hands-on as far as being engaged in their children's lives, not necessarily taking on more domestic duties, but more fatherhood duties. However, of course, these men often have very time-consuming employment. And so the author Hothschild wrote a book called The Time Bind in which that dilemma is addressed. In some European countries, they offer very generous paternity leave. And the author states that even when paternity leave is offered in many countries or by certain companies, that it's often not taken because men still feel the need to focus on their career more so than this taking this particular time off during the birth of their child, or that their boss is gonna look down on them, or that they're going to face suspicion or ridicule. And so even when men do really wanna get more involved as fathers, they're just not allowed to, or they don't themselves take that time away from work to invest in their children in this way. And so the, this section is concluding by saying that men still dominate in positions of power and privilege. So it's not because women are taking over these positions, but just that a lot of inequality is developing between the rich men and the poor men and the working class men who are losing their jobs while the rich transnational class is making much more extreme amounts of money. The next section is called Locked In and Shut Out. This section continues to examine then the changing roles in men and women in the family in the workplace and some of these outcomes. So the author states that the men's role of authority and autonomy are replaced by more distant authorities. The women's role of caretaking and daily 
providing are still needed, however. The author states, poor women become locked into the global economy and poor men get shut out. So as poor men and working class men are shut out of these economies, and that's because their jobs were outsourced or they've lost their job because of technological changes, women's roles, especially as caretakers, are still present and they get locked in. So the men are shut out from the industries, the women are locked into these houses. The author states that because men are facing this downward mobility and feel very alienated and angry that because they can't take it out on the bosses who own the factory that left or these distant men that are controlling their fate, that they might take out their anger and aggression on whoever is at close at hand, which is the women and children. And so women and children are still the targets of male violence within the household. So in some situations, women and children might be dealing with male violence and male aggression. In other situations, the men have left for the city to seek employment, and so they're not there at all. And so who is left in these rural villages are women and children, and so they might come together and support each other. Extended family, extended kin. The author introduces us to a key concept term, matrifocal which means the family centering on the mother and female kin and not necessarily matriarchal, which entails that women are the holders of power in society. So just that distinction of matriarchal and matrifocal becomes the new norm, especially in the rural areas then. So in this quote, the author states, women often find themselves locked in, locked into a house full of never ending demands or locked in sometimes literally to the demanding drudgery of an electronics or textile plant. Men often find themselves locked out, locked out of the labor market and eventually out of their families. The author states regarding raising children that agrarian societies, when the family had a farm and was staying on their own land, then having children was an asset for <laughs> reasons of child labor. The child can work in the fields. When women have to go to the factory or to a particular workplace, then that causes extra complications for their caretaking duties. And the author points out that women have often been in positions where they could work at some kind of job where they could bring their children along. And so children were often close at hand to women working. And now women are entering into these professions that were designed on the idealized male worker. And so, these careers then have to change and incorporate women within their workforce. But when we see women entering into these professions, that's when we can really notice that this profession was not made for them. And so their particular challenges as women, as mothers, become more of a social problem within that context. The next section is called the feminization of migration. And so in previous sections, he's talked about migration as men working as laborers, leaving families in rural areas to pursue agricultural work or building within urban environments. Now the chapter turns to the ways in which women are being recruited as migrant workers. The section opens by saying that slavery has returned or has never left because there are many different industries globally that are creating systems of debt peonage that tie people to jobs in industries that are very abusive in nature and that even consist of slavery. The author provides several examples, such as in Southern Europe, women from Albania and the newly independent Eastern European countries are promised high wage jobs in Greece and Italy. The women then have their documents seized and are sold as domestics, laborers, and even prostitutes. Some end up working in sweatshops or in factories in which they live inside the factories as well, so they're really in a total environment. The section mentions the book called Global Woman, Nannies, Maids, and Sex Workers in the New Economy. And this book really followed the global trends of how wealthier countries have imported a lot of migrant women workers. And they mentioned how in Hong Kong, for example, the majority of domestic workers and maids are from the Philippines. And I've been to Hong Kong and seen the site where on Sunday is the day off for all of these 
domestic workers who work across the city and they flood the public spaces, the parks, and they put down like tarps and tents and bring coolers and spend the day with each other in these public parks. So it's, it's quite a sight and really interesting to see this diaspora and how they come together. The section concludes by talking about how women in remote parts of the Amazon have actually taken up selling Avon and makeup products to other women along this river. And so they get into these canoes and, and boats and sell makeup to indigenous tribes. The next section is called Global Family Changes and the subsection under that is called Marriage and Divorce. And so this section looks at global trends over history in marriage and divorce rates. The section starts out with the author writing, quote, around the world people are marrying later and divorcing more often. And of course that's in contrast to a historical trajectory in which people entered into marriages at a very young age had children at a very young age and also, you know, died very young. The author uses the key term patriarchal to talk about traditional family life and that these were patriarchal in structure, meaning that men held the power in communities and also the heritage line of the family was through the male side of the family. And so men pass on the family name to other men. So this section is just talking about early, early trends in marriage. So the most important thing about marriage for us to understand is that it was not about romantic love at all like it is in our contemporary era, but it was about the union of families and it was about bringing together families of the same social class, making sure that there was familial control over the land and inheritance. And this was definitely not left up to the marrying couple, but this through arrangements with parents and extended families and community members. And of course, these inheritances within the family are going to be passed along lines of men in the family. Additionally, it was a way for men to be sure of their paternity of their own children is by having a wife that's cloistered away in the house who's controlled. And so these traditional marriages are talking about more rural agrarian societies, of course, and that how industrialization and the shift to the factory as the workplace changed marriage patterns. And so now people were in more urban environments, in industries working and having the opportunity to meet people of the opposite sex. And so these patterns shift over time. But with the rise of industrialism is this turn towards companionship marriage. And the author states how arranged marriages is still practiced in Asia, particularly in India. So while arranged marriages would have been more of a global norm hundreds of years ago, it does persist, especially in India. The section jumps quickly through time and talks about how this idea of companionship marriage, that you can marry someone that the person themselves choose because they enjoy their company and it's not about inheritance or joining one's family with their family, but just that this rise in companionship oriented marriages has also led to marriage equality for same-sex couples. So that's really jumping ahead into our current time period. And the section does have a a picture of a map that shows same-sex marriages where it's legal and where same-sex couples have some rights in the world. But you can see on this map that for sure it's the Americas and Europe Western industrialized countries that have legalized same-sex marriage and that it's just not a thing in most of Africa, Asia, Russia. The section moves ahead then from romantic marriages, which are then established by mid-century, to talk about the divorce rate then. And the, the chapter doesn't quite mention that it's really the establishment of no-fault divorce that provides this huge upward trend with the divorce. And so as soon as divorce is accessible to the people, and before that it was very prohibited, you had to prove your case and so on, that after the event of no-fault divorce is when the divorce rates go way up right around 1980 and then have been in a downward trend ever since. And so my students in sociology of the family are always talking about sky-high divorce rates or teen pregnancy rates, but in actual fact, these rates are super low now compared to the highs that were in the 1980s. 
behind the United States, then divorce rates are also climbing in all countries across Latin America, despite these countries having a very Catholic and agrarian heritage. And additionally, an outcome of divorce, of course, is for a family is that they lose that male breadwinner. And of course, if women are left with children and the woman is making far less money than her male provider, that the women and children are at a higher risk of poverty, which it gets back to that key concept of the feminization of poverty. So following the section on marriage and divorce rates is the section on parenting and talking about just how the role of parenting as relating to mothers and fathers has changed across time and place. And so as the other sections have reinforced that women overwhelmingly bear the duty of caring for small children. And so sometimes, especially in agrarian societies or other local industries where women could go to local workplaces, they often brought their children along with them. But the section is focusing on contemporary outcomes. And so it points out that in one extreme, you have European governments that are eager to provide for the children of the nation to provide a strong start and to encourage birth rates. And therefore, European countries notably offer generous maternity and paternity leaves from work, guaranteeing their job and providing maternity leave for up to one year of paid work. And after this paid leave where their job is guaranteed, then the state also provides a great deal of subsidized childcare. The section mentions in France, for example, has heavily subsidized childcare through the state which makes it affordable for the citizens. And in another t context, they state that in China or India, childcare would likely be given by a grandparent. And so in China, for example, it's tradition that the in-laws move in with the couple when they have a child, and so that the in-laws can therefore provide childcare for the child, and at the same time be taken care of in their old age. In the United States then, lacking these subsidies for childcare, becoming a single parent through divorce is the single greatest factor for poverty. And it's here that they point out that Sweden has one of the world's highest rates of single parenthood, yet also one of the lowest rates of child poverty. And says, you know, how can this be? And that's because in Sweden, they have a very low rate of marriage. People marry much later in life, or they just don't marry at all. Often that these women women who have children that are counted as single have a male partner in their life that probably they even live with, but it's just not counted because they're not officially married. And the state provides a lot of subsidies for maternity leave as well as childcare. This section also talks about rates of teen pregnancy. And so it states that in the United States, the teen pregnancy rate is at an all time low. And historically, of course, we've had very high rates of teen pregnancy, but you know, 100 years ago, that's because people were getting married as teenagers. So they were married, they were having children while they were still teenagers. And then in the 1950s, you would have more rates of teenage marriages. That there was a brief rise in teenage pregnancy rates in the 1980s. And since the 1980s, it's been steadily in decline. However, in compared to other countries, other industrialized nations in the world, the US does have the highest rate of teen pregnancy. So therefore, just that parenting is an issue that governments and societies are going to have to navigate, especially considering the changing demographics of families and just the lower rates of having a two-parent household and a two-income household. And so there are gonna be increasing rates of single parenthood and how can the state really support these parents in this situation? The next umbrella section is called Half the Sky, and the subsection underneath that is called The Continued Perils of Being Female. So the author turns to the United Nations reports to measure the changes of women's safety and security in the world and women's rights globally. And the first document that he cites is the United Nations Population Fund 2000 report noted that conditions for women around the world has have improved since 1994 when 179 countries pledged to do more for their women. And so absolutely, women's rights have changed significantly. Just think about the last 100 years, the last 100 years in the United States. I mean, 100 years ago, 1924, 
women didn't have rights that they do today. They didn't have the rights to work freely to support themselves, to get married, to get divorced, to have their bank accounts, and to really have autonomy over their body and their lives. That they were very dependent on men to provide for them. This dependency places women in a vulnerable position as they're vulnerable to male violence. This section also goes on to quote a the UN Department of Economic and Social Affairs report called The World's Women 2020 Trends and Statistics. So this document notes 25 years of progress in education, legislation, and women in leadership globally as far as total numbers. However, this document was also able to capture the data that the COVID-19 pandemic really did set women back within their realm of rights and autonomy. And so this section includes some statistics such as globally 750 million women and girls were married before the age of 18 and at least 200 million women and girls in 30 countries had undergone female genital mutilation. In 18 countries, husbands can legally prevent their wives from working. In 39 countries, daughters and sons do not have equal inheritance rights. And 49 countries lack laws protecting women from domestic violence. So of course, these are small numbers of these countries that don't provide those rights. Of course, we can insert that the vast majority of countries do provide these rights. But of course, within that, like if the law is on the books, we also wanna know at what rate the law is enforced and how different difficult it is for the enforcement and for the punishment of the perpetrator. The section also mentions one in five women and girls, including 19% of women and girls aged 15 to 49, have experienced physical and or sexual violence by an intimate partner within the last 12 months. Yet 49 countries have no laws that specifically protect women from such violence. And of course, as we know in the United States, we might have laws on the books, but they are hard to enforce. And rape is probably one of the crimes that is the least enforced. And historically, it wasn't in until the early 1970s, which for example, marital rape became a crime. And so before that, women are considered the properties of their husbands and their husband had the right to abuse their wives. It took the feminist movement then to fight for domestic violence victims and their rights within that situation. Another statistic that this section mentions is that globally, this percentage of women in national legislatures has slowly risen from 12% in 1997 to almost 25% in 2020. And they provide a map of this global trajectory of women entering into the political system. The section also includes a chart on the gender pay gap in select countries and shows that South Korea is at the top of this chart with 33% gender-based pay gap. So just an overview of women's rights contemporarily, how that compares historically, but that there are still a lot of problems that women are dealing with globally. The next and concluding subsection is called Feminist Theory and World Feminist Movements. The section opens with a grand narrative statement that states, for the first 5,000 years of civilization, which were characterized by large-scale agrarian and pastoral societies, men dominated both the economic and political life in most societies. Feminist theories have referred to this as our legacy of patriarchy or male control and dominance. So the author defines the key concept of patriarchy, refers to the structure of institutions and whole societies in ways that subordinate women women, children, and anything considered feminine. So 5,000 years of civilization has lived under patriarchy and then it jumps to the 1840s in the United States focusing on the women's movements that emerged there. This movement that emerged in the 1840s was oriented towards the abolition of slavery and also the right for women to vote. The struggle for women's right to vote took about 73 years to achieve, and that was achieved in the year 1920. So that's an important date for us to remember. We need to remember the year that women got the right to vote and that it did take 73 three years of struggle. Then the section skips ahead to the feminist movement of the 1960s and 70s that takes place in a social context where lots of social movements are happening, where there's a popular protest against the Vietnam War. 
And so women really fought for their equal rights in their abilities to enter into institutions of higher education and enter into the workforce and to have rights of their own. It was not until 1972 when women got the right to have their own checking account. And a lot of these rights take place in the 1970s, 1973, Roe v. Wade, uh, the right to abortion, the right to contraception, and the outlying of discrimination practices in the workforce. He cites Hillary Clinton, so we really associate Hillary Clinton especially with this second wave feminist movement and this uh, aspiration of a woman president. Then this section also moves on to talk about random men's movements that have happened in the United States, especially in the 1990s. And so he cites the US-based poet Robert Bly, who wrote a book called Iron John in 2004, calling on men to get back in touch with their masculine side. So go out into the woods and have these retreats where men are reclaiming their masculinity. The author also mentions the group called the Promise Keepers, which were a evangelical Christian men's movement that really wants to reinforce these kinds of traditional gender roles. All of these movements that they're mentioning are trying to reinforce and go back to this nostalgic masculinity. As we saw in the last chapter, they talked about modernity theory versus traditional theory. This could also apply to this situation where these men and men's movements are pointing towards this kind of traditional nostalgic past. The section mentions the Million Man March for African American Men, which took place also in the 1990s in Washington, D.C. But the author is also stating that these kinds of nostalgic aspirations of going back to traditional masculinity those types of roles in societies of 500 years ago, of 1,000 years ago, are just not useful in this contemporary era. And so traditional gender roles have changed. What society needs for men and women have changed. And so men are a bit lost in that aspect of being unsure of how their masculinity can evolve with the times. And so a lot of these types of men's movements then are just these very nostalgic throwbacks to reinforce gender role behavior, which also reinforces, of course, patriarchy because men would be on the top of these traditional gender roles as far as a hierarchy is concerned. And finally, this section concludes by mentioning the book Half the Sky, Turning Oppression into Opportunity for Women Worldwide. And so this book is based on this quote of a Chinese proverb that women hold up half the sky. But then this book goes on to document how women are often not allowed to share in the power and responsibility of their societies in equal measures. And the book is arguing that education can be a very powerful tool to empower women and to fight poverty and extremism. The final sentence states, women aren't the problem, they are the solution, or at least half the solution, with men committed to creating change as the other half. So there you have this chapter that focused on gender and family and the changing gender roles and dynamics historically and contemporarily. And so it would be a good idea then for you know folks who are following along in my class to think about some kind of women's movement outside of the United States. The chapter focused on on social movements exclusively inside the United States for this section, but think about a gender equality movement in another country and what their objectives were, what they were trying to achieve, and what the outcomes were for that society so we can learn together from different examples. But let me know what you have seen globally as far as changing gender roles in different countries, and I look forward to seeing you in the next chapter which is on the topic of education around the world.